I sort of uh, tend to believe that you can't avoid metaphysics. You know, um, everyone is, every culture has a sort of underlying metaphysics. And when it's implicit rather than explicit, as it is in Britain for most of the time, it means it's functioning well, like a religion. You know, if a religion is, uh, if you don't know that you're within a religion, but you think oh, that's just, you know, knowledge and reality, then it shows the power of the religion, right? Same with metaphysics. The general view is like, well, either you're a physicalist or a dualist, you know, and that's it. And we reject dualism, so this is all that's left, physicalism, you know, which is not, of course, there's a false dichotomy. In. Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. I'm very happy to have back on the podcast this week, Peter Shurstedt Hughes. Peter is a philosopher of mind who specializes in the thought of Whitehead, Nietzsche and Spinoza and in fields pertaining to panpsychism and altered states of mind. Following his degree in continental philosophy at the University of Warwick, he became a philosophy lecturer in London for six years, after which he pursued a PhD on pansentient monism at the University of Exeter, where he is now a research fellow and associate lecturer. Peter is the author of the book Numenautics and Modes of Sentience. Today, we discuss his recent paper on incorporating the exploration of metaphysics into psychedelic therapy. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, I'm here with Peter Shuster Hughes. Peter, thanks for coming back on the podcast. Good to be here again, James. Good to see you again. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So um, we, the occasion of us chatting today is because you had this great paper that came out on um, kind of bringing metaphysics and philosophy into psychedelic therapy. Uh, so that's the main thing we're going to be exploring today. Um, for anyone who wants to kind of, I guess, look at the paper, could you, could you do you have, remember the title off the top of your head? Is it on the need for metaphysics in psychedelic Therapy and research, yeah. On and the research. need for yeah, that's right. On the need for metaphysics and psychedelic therapy and research. And it's open yeah. access, free. Um, you can just Google that, you'll find it. I'll put a link in the descriptions as well. Um so yeah, maybe we can begin with a bit about just kind of defining metaphysics. Um yeah, let's just start there if you're up for that. Okay. Um <clears throat> well the reason I wrote this paper partly is because metaphysics was not it's clearly defined in um, many of the um, psychedelic trials um, being uh, run these days. So often metaphysics was kind of uh, seen as synonymous with spirituality or with mysticism or with supernaturalism and so on. Um, and this is, this is from scientists and psychologists and so on. And of course, in philosophy, metaphysics has got quite a strict um, definition and it came from philosophy, obviously. So um, part of the paper is, you know, just explaining what metaphysics is and how it differs from mysticism. Um, and as I explain in the paper, the old story uh, known to philosophy students, at least, which is that um, the word metaphysics comes from Aristotle's book called The Metaphysics. And it's called that because um, it is believed that it's a, it, well, it is a collection of texts bundled together by Aristotle, or rather the texts written by Aristotle bu bundled together by a later editor, hundreds of years later, and people believe it's Andronicus of Rhodes, um, who, 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 who collected these sort of miscellaneous papers in a way and put them after Aristotle's book, The Physics, also a bundle of papers. I mean, literally after on the shelf and meta, one meaning of meta is after or beyond. And so it's like, you know, the stuff after the physics. Uh, that's where the word comes from. And but luckily, meta as well as after means beyond. So it sort of means uh, those it, it involves questions that go are generalities, you know, very abstract concepts that go beyond uh, concrete physical um, questions. So metaphysics today is basically based upon Aristotle's book, but much expanded therefrom. So uh, what do we find in Aristotle's book, the metaphysics? Questions about substance, that what, you know, what underlie, what are basically things made of? Is it, you know, mind, uh, matter? Um, how do they relate, you know, form, content? But also very sort of uh, technical questions about what causation is, um, what modality is, you know, what is necessity, what is possibility, what is impossibility, and so on. Um, um space time universals you know these apps what well, aristotle himself didn't use the word metaphysics obviously then uh he used the word first philosophy those things that you sort of have to first get to grips with before you can um really speak about how everything else hangs together as it were 
one book in the metaphysics is on God or Aristotle's God. It's theology, really, um, but it's a non-religious theology. So it's about God as a prime mover, who's the ultimate narcissist. He's thought, or it is thought, thinking about itself, thought. Um, and it's not a denominational, it's not linked to any kind of pagan religion of the time or anything later, really. And it's the first cause, that which sets the universe in motion, ultimately, through a teleological uh, objective. Anyway, so the, this is the kind of stuff... Um, um, that that is metaphysics in the academic world. The, the word has obviously taken on many other meanings since then, but that's what it is still, strictly speaking. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> related to that, interestingly, um, in the 20th century in philosophy, metaphysics became a kind of bad word because there were a lot of very kind of, you know, interesting metaphysicians, I think, like especially the British idealists in Oxford and um, Scotland and uh, and people such as AJ Eyre came along and said, actually, all of this is uh, complete rubbish. It can't, can't be verified. It's literally meaningless or nonsense. And then philosophy language um, sort of took over in academia, at least. And metaphysics was sort of put on the back burner, seen as nonsense for a while. But then towards the end of the 20th century, uh, people realized that actually, no, these positivists and so on, they were actually presupposing a type of metaphysic and themselves and uh, the actual that logical positivism for example got into a lot of problems and thus we had the metaphysical return about 20 30 years ago so now we teach metaphysics in university again i do but it's generally analytic metaphysics as i call it so it's kind of not big systems like leibniz's or spinoza's systems of metaphysics but it's rather you know like let's look at what you know mental causation is that in detail you know or let's take the concept of um necessity and break it down into its constituent parts you know it's very dry it's quite difficult demanding subject at a uh, uh, university really and i think a lot of philosophy students who go in to, you know they, <laughs> they don't know what they put themselves in for really but i think right. it's fascinating it's a fascinating subject so yeah in a nutshell that's what um how i understand metaphysics right yeah i can imagine people going in thinking they're going to be having kind of quite psychedelic conversations about like are we a dream in the mind of god and that kind of stuff and then actually you've got very very kind of rigorous logic yeah well yeah. yeah i mean as i've as we teach in exeter university for example it's like that however if you if you come and te learn it with me now i do bring in sort of some psychedelics stuff. right i would expect you would <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah and the, there's an interesting bit in the paper you mentioned about aj Ayer, who um as you say was this kind of logical positivist if you can't verify it wasn't he wrote a paper called the, on the impossibility of metaphysics right just basically yeah. saying let's move beyond this um but you point out that he, he he choked on some food later in his life and had a kind of i'm not sure if you'd call it a near-death experience but that seemed to kind of lead him to make some metaphysical claims yeah well i would call it a near-death experience i mean um he he called that essay um you know writing about it the undiscovered country meaning death you know shakespeare so it, it was it, and he almost he nearly died so it wasn't a death experience okay i guess it um, was <laughs> But it was kind of like, um, you know, so so it's very interesting. Yeah, so he was a logical positivist, wrote on the impossibility of metaphysics in the 1930s. And then slowly over time, he realized all the problems with that position until he reached, you know, in the I think on, on, on the BBC, he said, and one question, you know, asked what was wrong with logical positivism. He said, well, nearly all of it, you know, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and that was in the sort of late 70s. And then, yeah, in the, in the 80s, as you say, he choked on salmon whilst suffering pneumonia already in hospital and then yeah he had this vision of going into space and meeting these light beings and time being cracked and so on and uh and afterwards and this was just you know just one experience he suddenly he wrote an article for the sunday telegraph about it um it was actually called in the paper what i saw when i was dead and it was re later renamed the undiscovered country but uh, what he wrote in that article it was that uh maybe he speculated very speculative, but he said, maybe death is not the end of consciousness after all. Still don't believe in God at all, but, you know, it's a possibility. <laughs> so this one is it's just quite interesting how one experience, okay, it wasn't induced by psychedelic drugs, but it was, might as well have been, um, uh, had this kind of, uh, caused this kind of metaphysical shift in, in, in someone like AJ Air. Yeah, I wasn't aware of the details of the experience. That definitely sounds like a prototypical near-death experience. Um, mm -hmm. And so that leads us into, yeah, as you were saying, the kind of comparing, contrasting the differences between metaphysics and mysticism, because they're not the same thing. And um, before we dig into that, you know, it's interesting that I, for the longest time, was kind of quite skeptical of, of engaging in metaphysical kind of narratives, partly because my interest in this whole space came from an early mystical experience. 
that um, left me with a, a kind of a sense, and a, you know, this is, a, I guess, a metaphysical claim, but a kind of negative theology type metaphysical claim, and that reality itself is non-conceptual. You know, when you really want to get down to what reality is, language fails. That was my, and still is my intuition. Um, so I have a, I've always had a kind of skepticism around holding too tightly to any metaphysical narrative. But then, as you know, maybe as a parallel thing here, where well, as the years have gone on, I mean, I think I. It's interesting to note that I think often we we have implicit metaphysics or we're engaging metaphysical kind of claims without realizing it if we're not rigorous. Um, yeah. So I've embraced it more and more, and I'm definitely now I would say very interested in it. Um, but still with that that note of caution, but um, uh, not to hold on to them too tightly. So uh, so yeah, maybe you could go into a bit about the differences between metaphysics and uh, mysticism. Yeah. Well, firstly, I say this that. Um, you know, with regard to metaphysics, and especially the metaphysics of mind, which solely looks on the matter, really the relation between mind and matter, in terms of nature, really, um, there are no definite solutions to this, you know, that we, we, get, we have to move beyond verificationism. When we talk about the mind, because of the problem of other minds, which is that you can't really get... Um, get to know what it's like to be another being because uh, you filter it through your own, you know, system of perception. Because we can't really um, verify other forms of consciousness. For example, the question as to whether a plant is conscious or not, we can't, haven't got a machine which sort of scans that. Right. We can see the physical correlates and then we only can infer through philosophy really um, whether it's conscious or not or sentient or not. So um, therefore, it's never a question of proof. You know, it's not, it's not science in the restricted sense of physics, chemistry, biology, you know, it is a science in the German sense of Wissenschaft, you know, like a methodological study, but, um, you know, we're talking about inference to the best explanation with these questions. Um, it's not mathematics, it's not science, it's a combination of all. Anyway, so that's one thing. Um, and yeah, that means ultimately we'll never, I don't think we'll ever reach a point of total comprehension where we all think, okay, finally, we've got it. You know, it's, it's, right. Even if someone does get it, you know, people disagree. So, so what's the difference then between metaphysics and mysticism? Well, um, it's a complex subject, really. Uh, first of all, because we don't do it. I mean, like I said, metaphysics has a specific academic um, meaning, really. Uh, people even disagree, though, as to its purpose there. And mysticism, likewise, is a very controversial subject when you talk about its definition for reasons such as the fact that um, different thinkers have defined it in different ways. Uh, for example, Bertrand Russell and William James defined it in somewhat different ways, and they've both got full criteria for it. Um, there's also questions about whether there's a core mystical experience, which is metacultural, which is known as perennialism. So the view that um, regardless of one's culture, one has the same core um, experience, even though each culture interprets it a different way. That's perennialism as opposed to contextualism, which says that actually your culture determines the experience itself, as well as the interpretation. That's a, an ongoing discussion. There's a middle way, of course. Um, and then questions as to whether the experience is veridical, like objectively true, or whether it's delusion. So, uh, so mysticism itself is a kind of um, ambiguous term, but you can trace etymologically at least. You know, you can trace the word back, and it goes back to Maya or a Greek, ancient Greek meaning uh, closed or concealed. And uh, it's believed, it's a bit ambiguous as far as I understand it, this philology, but it's believed that it means closed lips or closed eyes. And that relates to the mysteries, um, like the Eleusinian mysteries, for example, not only those, but that's the, that was the, the main one in Greece, ancient Greece. Uh, the mysteries where people went into a temple and um, got rid of the fear of death, saw amazing visions and so on. And it's believed that they took a, a potion, a psychoactive potion for this thank you. But that even that is under, you know, even that's under questionable. Although they did recently find ergot residue in a um cup in a in Spain, dated to 200 BC, um, surrounded by vases and whatnot, dedicated to Demeter and Persephone, just the two goddesses of the Eleusinian mysteries. So there is like gain, there's evidence for it. Anyway. Um, Just to interrupt, I actually had Brian Moreski, who wrote the the book, The Immortality Key, that popularized that uh, on the podcast. Yeah. So when oh, that came right, out, right, so yeah. that well, episode's I, there if people want to dig into that more. Yeah, no, it's worth looking at. I met him actually last year, and he we were talking about that. He gave a presentation, and so I looked into it, and it is, yeah, it's, it's quite legitimate, yeah. and it's the best evidence yet we have for Ergot, you know, in Greece. But it wasn't found in Greece, but nonetheless, it's pretty close. Um, 
Yeah, so so mysticism, that ambiguous term, but yeah, if you trace it back historically, um, it means closed. Um, you were not allowed to speak about the mysteries, it was forbidden, and presumably one closed one's eyes to see. Um, Plotinus spoke about this, the first Neoplatonist in the third century AD, um, and he interestingly linked this this uh, this state, this concealedness, to a monist metaphysics. So when you trace the history of mysticism, um, as we understand it in Europe, through the actual word mysticism, we realize that it was originally sort of associated with, um, well, at least with Neoplatonism, with, within a sort of metaphysical system, you know, the one. Plotinus speaks about the one um, and becoming one, one with the one, as it were, you know, and, and then we get the classic subject, object dichotomy being diffused, as people speak about today. That So you can trace that back um, to a pre-Christian thinker. He was a pagan as well. So a lot of people say mysticism, as we understand it, in psychedelic trialism is a Christian thing. Well, it's not. I mean, it predates that. Christianity did, was influenced by you know, Neoplatonism and Platonism to a certain extent, but it, 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 it's not just Christian. And of course, in the 20th century, we brought in a lot of Eastern philosophy as well. Anyway, so um, mysticism is defined in many ways. I don't want to bore you like with William James's pint, you know, passivity, ineffability, noetic quality and transiency and so on. But um, it's defined in certain ways and you know ineffability means you can't really write about it and of course by definition mysticism means it's a mystery we don't know in other words it's inexplicable but metaphysics um i would say is all about explanation so mysticism allegedly inexplicable metaphysics is we're trying to find at least systematic metaphysics as opposed to analytic metaphysics systematic metaphysics is trying to find a general um, system of thought um, explained through reason, but also through perception, certainly in instances, explained through reason. And a lot of these metaphysical systems, which are rational, intellectual, I think can help to explain certain experiential metaphysical um, perceptions. So, for example, um, a classic you know, well, not classic, you know, a, a typical uh, high dose psychedelic experience could be, could give one the intuition that nature is God, or nature is divine in some sense, you know, and you could keep it at that. And that's, a, you can define that as a mystical experience, but you can also define it as a metaphysical experience. In this case, it would be a type of pantheism. And then there's a whole background of thought with regard to pantheism, you know, really starting with Spinoza in the 17th century and 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 then thereafter, and actually before that as well, in the and that's only in West. So you can you can therefore like have the experience, you can have the as it were, it's called the flash of Spinoza, or the flash of Spinozaism, I should say. And um and you kind of intuit the truth of it. And at the same time, you can read about it and you know for years study it and whatever. And so the argument is that the, the reading, the sort of uh, conceptual understanding of it could provide a framework for the intuition. You know, Deleuze, especially specifically with Spinoza, Deleuze said, you know, um, Spinoza is a, Deleuze said that Spinoza is um, a unique philosopher in many ways because you can both under, un, intuit the whole system in a flash, as it were. And uh, like Romain Roland had this flash, apparently he wrote the flash of Spinoza, in fact. And at the same time, you can spend years intellectualizing it as well. But so if one does have such a pantheistic insight under psychedelics, then, um, you know, one can have recourse to um, metaphysics, intellectual metaphysics, to make sense of that experience in that particular case, you know. Why would one want to do that? Well, I argue, and it is a conjecture, that if one has such an experience, let's say, in England, and... Um, it uh, create it has therapeutic value because it makes one gives one a grander gives a person a grander scheme of things a greater cosmic vision as it were where one's own self and one's own problems seem relatively trivial thus not needing to mask those problems with alcohol or addiction or whatever um, if that has a therapeutic value and there's some evidence that such experiences do have therapeutic value empirical studies recent empirical studies that are referenced in the paper um, then. I would conjecture that it would make sense to talk about those experiences with the participant and 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 um, discuss how 
Um, these are not just some kind of airy fairy mystical intuitions that can't be possibly are created by a part of the brain or can't possibly be true but say you know there are there's a good legacy of thought arguing that such experiences actually may be may have some truth to them you know not that we fully understand them in an exact fashion as i said but nonetheless um one shouldn't immediately dismiss them as delusion and then the conjecture is that 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 might add a longer term um might add longer term therapeutic uh, value to to the experience itself so you're actually sort of amplifying the experience which is therapeutic through the integrative phase with recourse to a kind of intelligible metaphysics right yeah i think i mean that's definitely my intuition that there's there are more ways of knowing than the rational mind and the in these mystical states there's there's some some truth being acquired in in certain cases you know you have to be careful with not just taking everything all of your intuitions uh, at face value which is again where metaphysics comes in is, is useful yeah. but yeah i definitely have the intuition that that in some sense often when we're dealing with high doses psychedelics can be kind of understood as a kind of metaphysical medicine where it's it's there's a deep grounding existentially that seems to be happening um that operates at a deeper level than just going through kind of autobiographical memories or you know a lot of the stuff that can happen in, in ordinary states of consciousness seems that way to me as well yeah yeah but like i said it is a matter for debate um psychedelics add a value to this mystic this old mystical debate started really with in the 70s with stephen katz's paper but yeah no i i think um you know a lot of experiences as you probably know seem to go beyond one's culture you know completely unrelate to one's culture and language right. in fact you know, people like David Powers always say that, uh, you know, psychedelics actually decondition one from culture, quite the contrary of being conditioned. So. Yeah, it's, you also mentioned in the paper, you know, other terms like numinous experiences and transpersonal experiences and um, Otto's definition of, of numinous experiences as kind of being more related to a sense of otherness a confrontation mm -hmm. with, with the other, which I found interesting because, you know, in my experience, different psychedelics produce different metaphysical intuitions. And um, whereas in the trials where we're dealing with high doses of psilocybin, you may have these, these kind of intuitions of unity and or non-duality, non-separation that aligns with, with Plotinus or, or Buddhism and you know, these kind of Eastern religions. Um, with DMT, there does seem to be this kind of radical of otherness that can can arise that seems to map nicely you know rick strassman's work he's kind of connected it with um the visions of like ezekiel in the old testament this kind of awful or you know in, in terms of full of awe but in a way that is terrifying confrontations with a seeming kind of um a god angels whatever something that seems simultaneously incredible but also kind of wish it wasn't happening to you because it's so kind of it doesn't feel like you're you're blissfully becoming one with everything it's it's a different kind of experience interesting thinking about otto in relation to this a number of people don't include not otto's so-called numinous experience as mystical they say because it's otherness you know some some purists as it were say that mysticism has to be about becoming unifying one's mind with a greater mind you know and if it's not that people like uh wr inge for example if it's not like that, then it's not mysticism. However, um, like I say, there's so many different definitions of mysticism anyway that I think I would, you know, I would, in I would include it to be, you know, charitable. I would include it as a type of mystical experience. But as you say, it's not necessarily pleasant. So you know, like the in Otto, that the idea of the holy, his famous book, you know, holy originally uh, didn't mean moral or even necessarily spiritual. It sort of meant um, it, re it related to the fear of God having experience of the fear of God. And that was originally, as you pointed out, serious fear. It was horrific of this other, and it was kind of like sublime in that sense, you know, the great the, the right. sense of the sublime is of terror, um, but a terror and, and of something you can't quite conceptualize, too much to conceptualize, like looking at the uh, starscape or something like this, or the ocean even, and God even more so. Um, and then the interesting question for me is, yeah, you do have experiences like this. Is it therapeutic? Not necessarily. I mean, there could be psychedelic experiences which are not therapeutic. You know, we shouldn't just assume they all are. Um, some could be detrimental to people. I accept that. And that's why we have to be careful and sort of, uh, you know, realize what drugs can cause what or, you know, if they are predictable in this way.
Another yeah. interesting aspect of it, or both of those, so whether it's a terrible experience or a positive one, or something that can't be classified as either, in most cases, actually, um, is whether the experience itself has a therapeutic effect or whether there's an underlying mechanism, biological mechanism, that has that therapeutic effect. So as you know, there are, at the moment, with there, there is in development so-called psychedelics, which don't have, um, don't induce any phenomenology, any experience at all. Um, I would I would predict that these wouldn't, if they are therapeutic, they would be have to be therapeutic in a manner different from the current mechanism of uh, therapy via psychedelics. You know, it would have to be something different, I think, because I think the experience, you know, seeing yourself as a small, the small self theory, as it were, um, in relation to great cosmic schemes, I think that's what generally plays a therapeutic role. Right. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And also in certain psychotherapeutic schools, there's this idea of self as context where it's it's not not only that there's this connection with something much bigger than yourself, but you know, the mystical union is one of feeling, in some sense, feeling yourself to be that, to be the one, to be, you know, I mean, you can talk about it in different ways. You could also talk about that as there being no self, but the getting outside of that confining sense of of, of being the small self. Um, and you also, you mentioned transpersonal experiences, but you don't go into it in depth. And my, you know, the way I would use transpersonal, I guess, is beyond the personal, right? Beyond that small self, beyond the ego. So if someone's talking about transpersonal love, it's a kind of a spiritual love and an opening to, there's not just kind of my sense of self as James loves that personal thing, but it's something, um, yeah, that feels beyond the self or ego. Does that is that how you yeah. think of transpersonal fitting to this? Yeah, I mean, so I did a lot of research on Stan Groff's work. Um, you know, and I, I do reference him quote him actually in the paper, and he talks about transpersonal experiences. Of course, some of it I find um, a little bit, for example, birth experiences and so on. I find a little bit hard to digest. But this paper is supposed to be neutral. So I, although I have my own personal sort of uh, right. physical positions, I'm not judging in any way. I'm just sort of offering a menu, as it were, of different options to in which to frame one's experience and people do have these um these natal experiences undoubtedly um so but with with regard to the trans i mean if you take in a literal sense transpersonal i mean um uh, there isn't a very interesting something very much connected to that i think is as it were nature connectedness where um and that has many different levels from just appreciating the beauty of nature nature like plants for example a little bit more to becoming the plants to becoming more than the plants as it were or to absorbing the feelings of uh, one's surroundings so that's that, i mean that's interestingly linked to a number of metaphysical views so for example um i think uh, alfred north whitehead could be handy here's process philosophy whereby um you know whitehead argues that we believe we have five main you know um, modes of perception, uh, including proprioception, interoception, and so on, you know, bodily feelings. But beyond that, he believes in something called prehension. He argues for this other form of perception called prehension, which is the sort of um, absorption of the immediate past of one's bodily state. But that immediate past is um, a feeling state. A, 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 it's, so it's a, a feeling that flows from the past into one's present but that feeling doesn't necessarily originate within one's body. So if you are, for example, a pan-experientialist, and this is what we spoke about last time, wasn't it? Or panpsychism. If you believe in panpsychism, then it means that feelings are not, not all feelings are necessarily endogenous. They don't all come from oneself. They could be absorptions from the outside, as it were. And so the feelings of nature connectedness often induced by psychedelics. For example, you, you feel that uh, you, you seem to feel the intrinsic value or the intrinsic kind of sentience of another um, plant outside of you. Um, this could be explained again. This could be fitted within a metaphysical framework. Obviously, the, tr the difficulty is you can't go through Whitehead's philosophy to someone who's got no interest in philosophy, right? They just have the experience. So... So the, the real um, hard task really is to make these forms of metaphysics intelligible to the man on the street. This is the next okay. stage that we're beginning to work on now. I think it is possible, um, but it's not easy. But anyway, the point, ultimate point is when someone has this nature connectedness, which is kind of transpersonal, you sort of, uh, you transcend the personal way of thinking of it so, um, in that general sense, then, uh, you know, again, there are metaphysical 
systems out there which can help make sense of it so you don't dismiss it again. Because when I say dismiss it, what I really mean is so one doesn't fall back into the default metaphysics of one's culture. Because I, I sort of uh, tend to believe that you can't avoid metaphysics. You know, um, everyone is, every culture has a sort of underlying metaphysics. And when it's implicit rather than explicit, as it is in Britain for most of the time, it means it's functioning well, like a religion, you know, if a religion is, uh, if you don't know that you're within a religion, but you think that oh, that's just, you know, knowledge and reality, then it shows the power of the religion, right? Same with metaphysics. We have a kind of metaphysics in Britain and Europe in the West uh, that you can trace back. Uh, historically, you can understand why it happened. Sometimes it's purpose. Sometimes, for example, um, it hasn't expanded because of purposeful suppression of other thoughts. You know, so so it's quite interesting to look at that metaphysical history to understand where we are now. Which means that there is no ultimate neutral form of metaphysics. You, know, you can't avoid it. You're in it, whether you like it or not. And so, you know, even this this metaphysical um, integration is also, I think, useful, potentially useful for therapists themselves to sort of discuss their own metaphysical assumptions, you know, bring to light that which that maybe they've been implicitly taught. Right. Yeah, it's interesting that we're, you know, in Britain at least, raised with an implicit Newtonian metaphysics, really. The, the metaphysics of kind of classical mechanics of objects moving through space in a deterministic way, it, mm -hmm. at least my impression is that's the... The implicit metaphysics, despite the fact that it was kind of shown to not apply uh, like a hundred years ago, um, when people studied the world smaller than the atom. And so I do think if, if people have been able to kind of take on board something like Whitehead, um, I mean, I think it's because we haven't come to some, you said earlier that we, we, we're never going to come to some perfect agreement around metaphysics, but I do think there would at least be some way to cohere a bit more towards something that fits the science better yeah. than what we currently have. I think so. I mean, I think this, this I mean, Newton, yeah, certainly very influential in England and, and you know, Descartes as well, you know, splitting up mind and matter. I think that's been very influential. Galileo before him, or, you know, concomitant with him. Um, but yeah, it's, it's I th you know, Spino I think the, the even Descartes realised the problems with splitting up nature from the mind, you know, how do they interact? The interaction problem was a big, still is a big problem. Um, you know, many proposed solutions, but um one very good solution, I believe, was from Spinoza, who said, listen, mind and matter are not actually distinct. They're just different expressions, attributes of the same one substance, you know, which he calls God or nature. And, um, you know, if you look at the history of that, Spinoza's thought was a kind of neutral monism, kind of panpsychism, kind of pantheism. Uh, it was ex it was purposefully suppressed, you know, like by, it was he was excommunicated by his fellow Jews and the church banned his books. And... Um, and so as a result, science um, kind of took this religious view that, OK, let's just look at nature as completely unminded, completely insentient. And uh, it's useful because we can quantify it, we can measure it and so on. And then, of course, the result of that is a hard problem of consciousness. Oh, shit, how does that mind come, you know, relate to, 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 to nature, which is completely dead, completely mechanical? Um, so and that's yeah, that is a default metaphysics of Europe, of the West, I think, at the moment. Um, so when you introduce someone like Spinoza, you, you kind of shake that up. I think Spinozism, for example, is not anti-scientific in the slightest. It's another framework in which science can operate. Yeah, I agree. And, um, you know, like Ernst Haeckel, the great, uh, he, he was the guy who, you know, famous for his drawings now of microorganisms, but he was the person who brought Darwin to Germany. And um, his kind of life mission in many ways was to, to create um, um, Spinozism as a groundwork for science he failed in that you know but i still think that's possible or well, some yeah. not spinozism exactly but something some kind of monism you know that uh, you know allows for different possibilities that stops you know pure neuroessentialism physicalism and so on i think yeah, you mentioned nature connecting us earlier as well and, and also that spinoza was suppressed kind of intentionally and i do think it's important to kind of it's it's um it was politically expedient for people to adopt Descartes view of, of nature as as unminded um, in order to exploit it right it kind of goes along with the rise of our modern economic system that yeah. is very much centered around treating nature as a purely purely in terms of its, its instrumental value for humans um, instead of having value in itself exactly. so to accept to take on Spinoza now 
people would, I think, have a, a gut instinct of like, wait a minute, but like, if nature is, has value in itself and is, is minded, then should we, shouldn't we completely change the way that we're engaging with it? To, to which my answer would be yes. But, um, yeah. I mean, this, this was, this was, um, yeah, this was the mission of Arne Ness, the great Norwegian philosopher who founded Deep Ecology, he wrote right. Spinoza and Ecology, and that was his argument, you know, that we need to, uh, that would provide a better way of approaching nature. Yeah, so I mean, the interesting split between mind and matter with Descartes, Galileo, Newton, and so on, um, I think was partly causative of the industrial revolution, the exploitation of nature, also partly causative of the split between science and religion, right. you know, as you know, so religion or the church was responsible for the soul, salvation of the soul, mind, and science was left with, you know, the sort of the, the uh, geometry that is nature. And right. uh, this kind of led, you could argue, to the ecological crisis we're in now. And also, I mean, I think physicalism generally, which by which I mean, there's many definitions of that, but by which I mean that, you know, um, you know, everything can be reduced to what we understand as the physical uh, in physics today. That's problematic because it, we know it's incomplete. But I think that general view is um, also probably causes a lot of alienation and people depression to an extent, you know, so it has other distressing, um, you know, ramifications. But anyway, that's just my own personal view. So this paper I've written, again, like I said, you know, I mean, physicalism is another metaphysical point of view, ironically, you know, metaphysical, metaph metaphysics doesn't mean beyond physicalism. It mean, it, right. Physicalism is just one of many metaphysical systems. Right. Another reason yeah. I created that, um, the, this kind of, I created, you know, in the paper, this metaphysics matrix with uh, 40 different views, but five main columns types is because speaking to, you know, Doctors of psychology, scientists, you know, in academia, the, uh, gen as well as people, you know, who, who haven't really, who are not academics. I mean, the general view is like, well, either you're a physicalist or a dualist, you know, and that's it. And we reject dualism. So this is all that's left, physicalism, you know, which is not, of course, there's a false dichotomy. In. Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, we've, we've pointed towards the fact that, that, I guess, engaging with metaphysics has consequences potentially beyond just a kind of an interesting intellectual exercise, right, in terms of shaping how we collectively behave. Yeah. Um, it'd be good to maybe turn to the metaphysics matrix, this menu that you described, so that you know, this can hopefully be used as a tool for people to, to make sense of metaphysical experiences they have under psychedelics. Um, I'll put it up on the screen for anyone watching on YouTube. Uh, and you mentioned that there's uh, five main columns, physicalism, idealism, dualism, monism, and the transcendent. Mm -hmm. And then you, it's a matrix, right? Because you have two dimensions and you've got kind of cutting through that panpsychism, which has each of those a different kind of, um, I guess, an intersection of those. So whether it's a panpsychist monism, panpsychist dualism, there's no panpsychist transcendent, I notice. Is that something that doesn't tend to exist? Well, it does. It, it, it's, it's complicated and this is not a perfect matrix. There is a panpsychism where there's also a transcendent um, like in Whitehead's philosophy, for example, the transcendent are known as eternal objects. But uh, the panpsychism itself within that system is imminent, not transcendent. So I've, I've, um, oh, I see. I've yeah, I've, trans I've translated it like that. I'm sure there probably does exist a panpsychological transcendent, but uh, I tried to keep it. I mean, this, for a start, this is a non exhaustive list. There are only 40 options in this matrix, and there are many more. Andy Letcher said it should have been 42, and I really do regret that there are not 42 options there. <laughs> but, but I think 40 is enough. Um, so, so, and it gives you, I think, you know, it's a start, and I think it gives people an idea that there's more than dualism and physicalism. As you see, dualism and physicalism is, is split up into different types as well. And, you know, it it's it's simply a start. But I think that most, you know, from what I've studied, and also not just in the West, but... Eastern philosophies as well, um, they can be pretty much reduced to, some, you know, most of these options. There are probably some outliers, but it's like I say, it's it's a first stab and it's work in progress. Yeah, it's definitely really interesting uh, the way you've, you've structured it. And so the final thing is you've got theism running across the five different categories as well. So if you combine theism and physicalism at the intersection of that, you've got atheism, for example, uh, and then Spinoza's kind of pantheism, uh, if you combine monism, neutral monism with uh, with theism. So yeah. I won't explain everything that's on the uh, on here. But I, you know, you mentioned for, for the purpose of writing the paper, you're you're not advocating for a particular position. But I would be interested to kind of explore this this matrix with you and see 
is there just one that can you firmly place yourself in one place or are there multiple things that resonate here for you personally i mean i like to say these days that i don't believe anything i just entertain ideas because anything i sort of hold i, I suddenly then read all the criticisms of it and it sort of <laughs> makes makes me not really um adopt any particular view but if i had to if you know it was a life death situation i would probably go for organic realism which is the um intersection of neutral monism and panpsychism so organic realism is whitehead's um philosophy which is a kind of bit like spinozism but it allows for it's not a deterministic so it allows for um an open future and a role for mental causation that's the kind right. of that's my personal um preference but you know i might be wrong and of course um an experience might not be that at all so um uh, you know but um but you know yeah in the paper all of those positions there's a glossary at the end which sort of tries to put all of those positions within one sentence each it was difficult but there at least it shows you that they are ren it is possible to render them intelligible right yeah the so my I like what you said about entertaining ideas. I'm definitely uh, in a similar camp there because I would say I would I entertain panpsychism, but that isn't where I I end up. So I'm, I'm also definitely in the neutral monism column, and I would say you could you could say the biopsychism uh, is where I currently sit because coming at it as a neuroscientist who initially studied the brain, thinking that was the place of consciousness, and then kind of came to a dead end and realized that's not the idea that the brain is necessary for consciousness and and you know, I, I felt I convinced myself that's that's not the way to think about it. So my passion is kind of making that leap from zoopsychism to biopsychism. Um, but then from biopsychism, I, I agree that it's 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 challenging, or I see why it's much more philosophically simple to presume panpsychism. And I would say you get you you get to a place where concepts start to break down when you're talking about is if something that we call physical constitutes mind, is it can you call it proto-consciousness? You know, I, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, discussions to be had there. Um, and then yeah. I would also say that I'm probably a pantheist. You've got pantheism and atheism at the intersection of neutral monism and theism. And I would say both of those definitely resonate with me. And it's, again, entertaining entertaining ideas and the limits of language, depending on who I'm talking to, I would like to emphasize kind of both of those aspects, I think, you know, lest uh, a vision of God be misunderstood. Um, pretty similar to me then but i yeah. i would prefer them biopsychism as you know and the reason is very right. basically that um um if you if you stop you know sentience at the level of life um the question then becomes well what is the level of life how do you distinguish right. the, the organic from the inorganic and for whitehead there isn't it that's again a false dichotomy you know you can't really have a cutting point you know so he, that's why it's called the philosophy of organism as well like even molecules are organisms yeah so it's, i mean for me um, the, the kind of teleo, the teleodynamics that living things show that they have this kind of end directedness when it comes to survival. Um, I am actually open to that playing out, not only at the level of the organism, but it, to me, it seems like a different kind of feed, a different kind of system. You know, life can recognize life, um, quite readily. Uh, but I should say that, you know, so my my metaphysics would be a kind of relational one where I think that what physicality is 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 relation. So it fits very nicely with Whitehead. I don't think it's instances of experience, but I think we could say interactions, events, relations. And I think embodied experience, consciousness is a complex form of relationality. So there is a continu continuum there. And if you said to me, "Oh, I really think you should call relations uh, proto consciousness because it's the thing that makes up consciousness," I wouldn't dig in my heels too aggressively. Um, but also the final thing I'll say on this is that um, in the first column under physicalism, you've got non-reductive physicalism and maybe it's because I'm trained as a scientist, but I still, I guess I'm also at pains to emphasize that I think in the way you were saying Spinozism, Spinoza's work isn't at odds with science. The vision I'm describing here completely fits with our scientific worldview. I'm not an idealist who's saying actually, mm -hmm. you know, experience comes first and the brain comes second or something like that. Um, I do think mind consciousness supervenes on what we're calling physical, but I just don't think physical is some substance. I think it's a process relational thing. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you for indulging my, <laughs> my <laughs> that's, metaphysics. Uh, that's very interesting. I mean, it'd be interesting if you filled in this um, questionnaire at the end of the uh, at the end. Yeah, of I should have done that for this. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah, I'll do that. Um, we have so, actually factorized that questionnaire now. It's not the next paper we're working on at the moment. 
But yeah, no, it's uh, mm, yeah. Well, I mean, you're getting into sort of deep metaphysics yourself there, and um, a lot of it relates to the meaning of words. You know, consciousness, proto consciousness, right? Exactly. Life, non-life. So, but uh, yeah, it's yeah. fascinating, fascinating discussions. No doubt. I think. I mean, it's, it's also been interesting, maybe, to explore what difference I think. So, what it kind of means to have a psychedelic metaphysical experience and where they might land here. So, my instinct would be if you come away from it feeling like you've had some insight about. The nature of reality or something in that kind of area that would be considered a metaphysical experience is that roughly how you think about it roughly so if your psychedelic experiences matches any of those 40 items then you can reduce it there right. too but of course in reality it's not that simple you know you're gonna have over if it takes out seven over six hours you know you can have multiple experiences and um you might not have systematic metaphysical experiences like um of pantheism or monism or whatever it may be uh, you might just have, um, you know, sort of intuitions of time, you know, something like that, which is also a metaphysical issue. Um, but yeah, the experience itself is often very messy. So, you know, through this, we're trying to sort of make it a bit clean up a bit. But of course, that's not reality. Um, so, um, but what I mean by like metaphysical experience so I'm, yeah, it's important to make this distinction yeah again between experiential metaphysics and intellectual metaphysics so i i draw upon william james to talk about um so i quote him saying you know something like um in a nitrous tra nitrous oxide trance we gain a genuine metaphysical revelation you know or this flash of spinozism that i spoke about you know um, we have to understand that metaphysics is not restricted to the intellectual, even though that's how we study it, of course, you know, just like we can study art, and it's not the same thing as creating art in many cases. Right. So so once you've made that distinction between um, metaphysics as intellectual and experiential, then you can then you can map the experiential metaphysics onto myst mystical, so-called mystical experience and realize that it includes more than what mysticism includes. Mysticism, as we have it in questionnaires today, are generally based on Walter Stace's 1960 book, you know, um, Philosophy of Mysticism. And I think it's quite limited. Um, for, exa uh, for example, like um, idealism, which is one of columns, is not included uh, within mysticism scales. And it's not really generally included within mysticism as we generally understand idealism. But nonetheless, you know, Humphrey Davy famously had a, had uh, on 200 pints of nitrous oxide had an experience of idealism nothing exists but thoughts or william james himself said he now understands hegel's idealism for better on nitrous oxide right this is not a part this is not an aspect of mysticism this form of you know um projecting you know that matter is a projection of the mind really um arguably yeah there are you know inter interlinks but you know idealism is quite a clear-cut philosophy in many ways and uh i just think that if we Created questionnaires based on metaphysics, then we just we broaden the horizons. We can have better, we can gain better, you know, quantitative data as well as qualitative data. You know, it's just a bigger survey. It's more comprehensive. Right. And not only is it more comprehensive, but it can be the actual experiences can be then associated with the with the intellectual systems for explanatory value, but also for explanatory value for the significance of the experience to the participant's life. Yeah, I think the, so the kinds of psychedelic experiences people often have, I think it is common for people to adopt idealism. I've seen in kind of spiritual communities, it seems very popular. Um, and especially with, you know, something where people have kind of entity encounters, you know, angels, demons, spirits, this kind of thing. You may, that may initially lead people to a kind of dualism, substance dualism, that there's truly immaterial beings, but then I think as you say, the, the, the difficulties of, of um, how these two le these truly different substances interact, I think a lot of people are aware of. And so for the sense, for a kind of sense of, um, of coherency, I think they often will move into a monistic picture of, of idealism that if, if even this is made of mind, then it makes it possible for these things to be real. Um, and you mentioned that uh, you can have multiple ones in, in within a, multiple different metaphysical experiences within a single trip. And I've definitely had experiences where early on with psilocybin you know there are kind of entity encounters that would lend to those two two camps if you took them if you wanted to kind of come up with a metaphysical system that made them real in some sense mm -hmm. uh, but then culminating in a uh, kind of ego dissolving neutral monist picture um but then you could also say even as 
before the, the dissolution happens and you're, you're very much in touch with your reality as an emergent form, non-reductive fiscalism suddenly feels a lot more relevant. You know, you no longer, in our culture, there's this sense that, you know, of, of epiphenomenalism that what's real is particles and everything that emerges is kind of not really as real. Culture isn't really as real as physics. Um, and I think that's incorrect and that people kind of be confronted with the reality of their existence at these emergent levels. Uh, so yeah, it's very interesting that you can you can go between all these different, you know, a lot of these different ones, even within a single experience. Yeah, and then the sort of philosophical question is whether they are coherent views or incoherent, you know, because of course it is possible that you know certain experiences are delusional, whereas other ones are true. And how do you? But how do you determine that? You have to go to metaphysics to determine what could be true or not, right? So anyway, um, but again, there's a negative. Posit there's a posit there's a value in the negativity which is um you can't you know it's very hard to rule out anything really if you say something is a delusion it means you know what reality is and that's quite a sort of dogmatic claim really right so um so yeah so the purpose of all of this is just to open up people's minds participants and practitioners to um real possibilities of reality that they perhaps haven't considered before I mean, metaphysics, generally, metaphysics is pretty alien to most scientists, you know. The reason for that is historical as well. Like, we, we started talking about how metaphysics was spurned during the 20th century, you know, and we're, we're still living in the legacy of that. People, As a result, you know, scientists are not taught metaphysics, whereas before that, you know, um, metaphysics, and or philosophy at least, was part of the kind of um, general education of scientists. Right. I mean, look at, um, yeah, look at Ernst Haeckel, like I said, for example, or... Um, or, uh, well, just about everyone, even even like Einstein, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, they're very much interested in metaphysics, you know, Kant especially. Um, but that's kind of lost with science to, today, unfortunately. So it's time to bring it back, I think. Yeah, I think the there's even probably a default assumption that metaphysical experiences are impossible in a sense that there's a there's a kind of I don't know if it's if it's influenced by Kant's split between the phenomenal and the noumenal, but it's. Uh, you said, for example, a good instance of this a few months ago, I saw Keith Frankish, the illusionist, illusionist philosopher, um, on Twitter mentioned he had a, a tweet about um, like how how could anyone possibly believe it's it's you can learn anything about the nature of reality through experience? Um, just thinking this was utterly absurd. Um, so that basically everything we're talking about here, that there's there's just nothing here. It's it's it must all be delusion. Um, and I think that's a common sentiment that a sense that there is this fundamental disconnect where we're truly with something like, you know, we're truly encased in our skulls as this small self disconnected from reality itself. We're not part of the universe. We're not, you know, um, and my impression is that's quite a, a common intuition, but, but again, that's also a metaphysical stance, right? That there, there is a kind of profound yeah. disconnect from what's true reality. So we can't actually have any insight there. Yeah, no, I think it is partly based on Kant's, you know, like uh, split between the phenomena and noumena. I think Whitehead is the solution to that um, with prehension, as I was saying, the absorption of the outside com to constitute the inside, as it were. But yeah, no, that is a general belief. And, you know, um, I think part of it, part of it's Descartes split, another part is Kant's split, but also neuroessentialism, which is that the brain, you know, just, just generates this stuff in a manner which is completely magical to everyone. So it's a favorite, right. you know, <laughs> like this is, you know, how, how the mind emerges from the brain, which J. Von Kim at least says is a kind of default position since the 1970s and the rest. This is just a complete mystery. Um, we know they're correlated. We don't know how it emerges or even how it could be identical. But nonetheless, um yeah it's taken hold i think christianity is partly to blame for this as well because it says you know only humans well with descartes christianity um only humans have souls um other creatures don't you know matter let alone you know plants um and therefore you know that possibly i mean there's speculation but that possibly had a had an influence on our view that well okay if it's only humans then you know it must be our brains and you're sort of restricting the soul as it were to the human to the brain and then to parts of the brain, or to, to part, certain patterns within the brain. Um, again, this is a metaphysical stance as well. You know, we don't know. I mean, like, you know, on a, the pure logical um, tenet here is that we we do not know what the necessary and sufficient conditions for consciousness is. Ah, rather. We do not know what the necessary and sufficient conditions for consciousness are. And therefore, we can't, we don't know whether the brain is necessary or sufficient for consciousness. 
you know, maybe the body is also involved, as you were saying before. And beyond that, maybe the environment is necessary as well. So um, as a result, because we don't know, and the interesting thing about that is it's not an empirical matter either. It can't be determined empirically, purely empirically. Because, you know, we can't, how do we determine whether, for example, a plant is conscious or not? You know, we can't, again, we can't look at it because of the problem of other minds. So therefore, it becomes a metaphysical position, this neuroessentialism, that, that the brain is necessary for consciousness. It's not a scientific position. It, but there you see how a metaphysics um, makes, sort of underlies what is believed to be objective and purely scientific, but it's not. You know, science is a methodology, but in the West, there's a kind of like, um, as it were, a parasite that, that, that sort of lives within it and change, you know, and, and has a big, I think, a big um, uh, causal influence on its methodology in terms of the hypotheses and experiments that are permitted. For example, um, you know, people talk about the neural correlates of consciousness. They do brain scans with even DMT recently and so on. You know, they're looking at brain. Why are they only looking at the brain? Why not the entire body? Why don't they scan the and get the sort of bodily correlates of consciousness? Maybe that will sh will yield radically different results. Maybe there's parts of the body which we didn't even think about. But at the moment, because of the neuroessentialist kind of metaphysical assumption, the experiment's not even there for the body. You know, it's just dismissed a priori. Right. There was an interesting paper um, over the last month, I think, uh, by scientist Michael Levin and some co-authors about um, saying that the immune system should be considered kind of as part of a cognitive, as part of the cognitive system that you, there's there's no good reason to just limit it to the nervous system. And so I think we're starting to see kind of, kind of as, as you're pointing to there, people, I mean, I'm hoping people will see that the, the, discon the, the idea of the brain as something separate from the body is really an idea. It's a, the, the cut, the cutoff line is something that we, you know, is an abstraction and a nervous system is nothing without the body that inhabits. Um, and there's nothing magical about nervous tissue. Uh, it's, it's yeah. impressive and interesting, but it's, it's not really fundamentally different to the rest of, of the body. Um, yeah. the nervous system is part of the body. The body is part of the external environment as right. well. And then you get into kind of four e-cognition theories of extended minds and so interesting, right, right. interesting. Yeah. Which don't go far enough in my view, but the, um, um, yeah. so so you know the interesting thing about all of this is really is like we're we're sort of um, going back to square one. <laughs> many of these ideas, you know, it's, it's like you know we I think we people even so neuroscience are beginning to realize they've assumed too much. You know, they've just assumed too much, and they haven't questioned their metaphysics, and thus. The cul-de-sac has reached. Now yeah. we're turning back. Yeah, hopefully going back and tracing our way back and finding where we took the wrong turn. And I think you're right to place the wrong turn roughly around between Spinoza and um, and Descartes. There's a kind of fork in the road there. Um, yeah, the wrong that, which coincides with the scientific revolution, industrial revolution. Right. And so on. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. You know, look, another example of how metaphysics changes science, you know, epigenetics... Um, was founded by Charles Waddington. And Charles Waddington um, based his experiments uh, secretly on Alfred North Whitehead's philosophy, especially the fallacy of simple location, that a gene, it, that um, a so-called thing, you know, like a gene or an atom, is um, partly constituted by relations. And so you change its relations. In other words, you change its location even, um, and you change what it essentially is. So, uh, uh, and that led Waddington to devise um, that kind of metaphysics, essentially allowed Waddington to devise experiments, which found, which essentially then led to epigenetics, you know, that, you know, a gene, uh, the sort of um, the expression of a gene depends on context. You know, it's not just one thing that will do the same thing wherever it is. Right. That's just one, yeah, one of think... the examples of, of how metaphysics inform science. Yeah, I think I think nothing really makes sense in, in unless we're thinking about them relational in, in relational terms. You know, like neurotransmitters, it's, people tend to think you know serotonin is the happy molecule or something like that, and they think it's contained within the serotonin. But then they find serotonin is in plants, and is it performing the same function? Well, no, it's like a lock and key mechanism. Depending mm -hmm. on what is connected to, it will it will unlock different processes. Um, but we still we still kind of have this habit of of narrowing this reductionist kind of habit of perceiving objects and, and imbuing them with essence, reifying 
what we perceive them to be and thinking exists within the thing instead of having this systems zoomed out holistic vision of of the interconnectivity of everything the relationality the unity um yeah. so i mean well, we've yeah. brought this full circle now to say you know, that that mystical insight could ho hopefully help at least i think uh deal with some of these these blocks yeah and the experience itself could sort of uh, bring people to uh see see the world in a different way which then might lead to different forms of experimentation and so on you know it could help science really in many ways um yeah so i'm quite hopeful about it um you just have to you just have to call out dogma where where it lies but you know in my experience scientists are not dogmatic you know they they just they're just not i don't want to sound arrogant in any way but they're just not taught they don't think about these things you know they're just not taught it it's just not part of their education anymore right. us. and so and thus they get sort of streamlined or they get into a groove you know that which they can't get out of they, they you know talking about epigenetic they're kind of um they're kind of stuck in a methodology which doesn't allow for um doesn't allow for development really in many ways right so before we before we end um if anyone wants to kind of use this matrix themselves uh would you recommend they, they look in, at the paper and kind of because you've got definitions of the different positions right and uh is there a particular way you recommend people use this well i mean it's devised primarily i would say for practitioners you know psychedelic assisted psychotherapists which is going to be a big industry soon it seems um so but 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 also I, I think it you know the second secondly it can be used for anyone you know who's not suffering from anything doesn't need therapy um but it's just a way of enriching your life i think you know so you have a psychedelic experience and um you know you don't know what it means or what it relates to um this will give you an indication of where you can begin to look you know how it might be construed by certain philosophers in the past um without any judgment you know so it's just sort of a yeah, it's just as it were a map, a map of um, of options. Yeah, you say that in the paper that it's kind of it has the benefit that um, it kind of validates people's experiences in the sense that they've had this this they might have had quite an out there experience and but it, by looking at this and saying well actually there's a there's a history there of people of t people taking this very seriously and putting a lot of time to kind of explore this stuff rigorously that could be quite validating for people instead of maybe the cultural norm, which is if you're straying from reductive physicalism, uh, then there's just no value there at all. Exactly, yeah. Show the, show the academic uh, history, the legacy, the seriousness uh, that such experiences, such ideas have had. I think that will help a lot of people. In my experience is Spinoza especially resonates with a lot of people who have never heard of Spinoza. People right. who surprise me, you know, surprises me who people who haven't heard of it really. But um, I think, yeah, it can have a general um, societal, you know, well, metaphysics can have a, generally speaking, can have a societal benefit, an enrichment of life, you know. So, um, but the, it, people are put off because, you know, prima facie metaphysics seems so inaccessible, but I think psychedelics can allow this access. And like I said, I'm working on a, a metaphysics manual, as it were, to make it intelligible, as well as a course for practitioners and the general public. And also, I'm talking about the stuff in, you know, next university, we've got a new PG certificate, postgraduate certificate um, opening up in January 2024, where we'll be talking about the latest um, therapeutic practice, clinical practice, you know, Celia Morgan, people like this, but also the metaphysics of mind, you know, what it means, as well as um, the latest neuroscience and cultural ethics relating there too. Right. I saw well, them in the news recently kind of advertises the... the uh... UK's first psychedelic postgraduate course, which is exciting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was in the Guardian even. Yeah, so um, so that's, yeah, pretty exciting. Like I say, if you're interested, uh, you, you can email me at this brilliant email address that we've got now, <laughs> psychedelics at exeter.ac.uk. Great. Is there anywhere else you would send people to if they want to look into this more? Yeah, there's, um, well, there's there's a web page. You Google that and you'll get to a web page where you can register your interest and then you'll get updates as they come along. Great. I can't remember the URL. I can give you the link. That'd be great. I'll put it in the description. Yeah, and thanks again. This has been great. Thank you, James. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, hope you'll do it again soon when your manual comes out. Okay. Deal.
Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.